we are in this remarkable Horta Hall, named after the architect of Bosa, Victor Horta. We thank Bosa for their generosity and our compliments to Tom and Chris for their advice and support here at Bosa. May I ask Paul Dujardin, the Director General of Bosa, to open this beautiful, beautiful ceremony. Mr. Dujardin. Ladies and gentlemen, and just a moment ago, we were all divided. We were all in separate small rooms, listening to writers from all over Europe. Ireland, United Kingdom, Greece, France, Ukraine, and nine other countries, and now. And now, we are all together in this big hall. For me, this is a metaphor, a metaphor for the state of Europe nowadays and the role that artists can play to unite us. It's not politics or economy that we share as human beings, but culture. Therefore, I'm very happy to welcome you at the Centre for Foreign Arts, Bozar, for the 10th edition of the European Union Prize for Literature. Bozar, Bozar is a proud European House for Cultural Institution with a dynamic cultural mission located in the heart of Europe and we have welcomed all forms of artistic expression in the course of years. Our literature department is a vital player in our artistic mission and the International Writers' Stage has welcomed both established as emerging writers. Bozar is also a place for exchange and dialogue with a clear international orientation. Our program focuses the arts and debates on what is the core of Europe and how we can work together towards a shared and foremost inclusive common future. The voices of writers and thinkers is crucial in making this possible and therefore I'm very happy to welcome and congratulate also the 40 laureates, writers of the European Union Literature Prize tonight. I hope that your voices will be heard all over Europe. You have the power to tell stories that unite us, and I'm delighted to witness the diversity and talent that you represent. I also like to thank all partners that made this evening possible. And first of all, the consortium behind the Literature Prize and also the cultural institutions that have expressed their support for this valuable prize. Last but not least, I also would like to welcome the politicians who will debate tonight about the role of culture in Europe. Dear Excellencies, we have the responsibility to listen to our artists and writers because they are the canaries in the coal mine as a great Belgian writer recently said. So please let them sing and give meaning to our lives. I hope you have a pleasant and inspiring Therefore, I would like to invite the Finnish Minister of Science and Culture on this stage. A very warm welcome to Hanna Kosonen, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Good evening. Dear laureates of the European Literature Prize, ladies and gentlemen, Commissioner, the impact and importance of literature in our society is undeniable. As a form of art, literature perceives and depicts the surrounding world, imagines the future, and gives insights into history. It gives 
us perspective towards different cultures and cultural identities. Thus, it broadens our horizons and enriches our life. Every artistic work always demands the serious work of creative and critical thinking. In that sense, one might say that a book is also a statement of its author. The statements are distinctive and carry the individual voice of the creator. Therefore, it's obvious that European literature composes the very basis of linguistic and cultural diversity. The diversity that we in Europe regard as our very elementary asset and source of creativity. Culture and society are not separable. We need literature to tell new and various stories. We need stories to remind us that pluralism as well as freedom of speech constitute well-being. Culture and literature work can be examples and means through which we will hear manifold voices promoting understanding of the significance of human rights in building and fostering our democratic Europe. The aim of Finland's presidency of the Council of the European Union is to bring forward the role of culture for a sustainable future in Europe and to integrate culture into EU's sustainable development strategy. Thus, our aim is to promote synergies between culture, democracy, and education. To say shortly, to foster critical and creative thinking and human capital. <coughs> Politically, we seem to live in rather turbulent times. Nationalism has been reawakened. The principle of a state government by the rule of law has been questioned, and people are worried about the climate change. We talk, talk even about climate anxiety of youth. I strongly believe that diversity, human capital, especially critical and creative thinking, may function as an antidote to these threats. They play a crucial role in promoting active citizenship and democracy. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we are gathered here to celebrate artistic talents. <laughs> Indeed, the European Union Prize of Literature is a celebration of artistic talents. However, the impact of tonight's celebration carries further. The prize promotes transnational circulation of books and encourages intercultural dialogues between authors and translators, as well as the publish publishing industry. Hence, the prize shows the importance of translated literature. Without translated books, we would not be able to enjoy the diversity of European writing and would lack an important means for building mutual understanding across the European borders. Along with the determined investments in translation, we need to work actively to promote reading. This is essential because reading is a means to our own well-being. For quite some time, we have been interested readers. However, in recent years, the motivation and enthusiasm expressed by children and adolescents towards reading has been on the decline. The reading habits are changing not only among children and young people, but in all age groups. Thus, it's highly important to support campaigns for the attraction of reading. To quote a reviewer, reading is 
survival skill. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, friends of literature and reading, I'm extremely pleased to, to introduce you the next speaker, Miss Toki Oksanen. She has managed to take me and thousands of other readers totally to another world with her books. Her books are that type that they capture all senses. This is how great art works. She is one of the most well-known and highly appreciated contemporary Finnish authors. Her work has been translated into more than 50 languages. She is also the recipient of a large number of prestigious awards, both in Finland and abroad. In addition to her literature work and success, she is an active debater of economic and social problems. Please welcome Sophie Oksanen. The publishing industry has its sights set on the north at the moment, and I obviously, obviously cannot but welcome that. But at the same time, it saddens me that the use in Europe is considered a particularly hot area for publishing. For example, Svetlana Alexic's book, Seven Time Time, offers an excellent analysis of how the rehabilitation of the Stalinist cult actually happened in Russia, and how its roots reach much deeper into the past that has been realized in the West. If it weren't for her Nobel Prize, there would have been very few translations of Alexievich's thick and from publishers' perspective, expensive book. In my own country, Finland, interest in writers from the former Eastern Bloc collapsed in the 90s. And Finland is not alone in this. The Soviet Union had once provided seed money to support the publication of selected writers abroad, and a variety of Soviet friendship associations had established their own publishing houses. And as this network disappeared, interest in writers from the former Soviet Union disappeared as well. Soviet writers were not seen as having any commercial potential. Their new books went untranslated, publishers no longer competed for their work, and it was futile to even dream of new books. In the wake of the Ostalgia War, works about the former TDR appeared for a brief moment, and some publishers were excited about the new countries that had appeared on the map, but only for a moment. I've been inquiring about why the interest didn't grow but decreased. And Matti Arnava, a Finnish translator, writer, and expert on Russian literature, provided an interesting explanation. Awareness of the censorship in effect during the reign of the Soviet Union managed to stamp the literature of the entire former Soviet region as second rate in the eyes of the Western world. Even when the censorship ceased, the stigma did not go away, and its influence can still be seen in Western publishing. At the same time, Russian classics from the 19th century are translated and reprinted over and over and adapted for new films. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, the publishers did pick up some books written by the immigrant authors, and they made some discoveries. Among the intellectual output of oppressed and silent dissidents, but publishers were picky. Their literary tastings didn't have a long lasting effect, and establishing oneself as a translated author has been extremely difficult for writers in these regions, even though the collapse of the system freed authors to write in completely new ways and entirely new areas of literary interest opened up for publication. It hasn't been easier for the new generation of Eastern European authors. When former Eastern Bloc countries appeared on the map as independent states, they seemed to appear out of nowhere. 
the new majority generation is coming from places which are not well known outside their own borders. And if foreign publishers don't know much about the country, one cannot really expect them to be interested in the country's culture either. I've been traveling to international book festivals around the world for 50 years, and I do bump into my colleagues from Eastern Europe and Baltic states, mostly in Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. I myself have written numerous works about the recent Estonian history, and all of my books have now been translated into a large number of languages. No one in Finland saw any translation potential in my first novel, Stalin's Cows, when I published the book in 2003. It was about the life of Estonians living in Finland, about the immigrant experience, and the recent history of Estonia during the Soviet occupation. Sweden, unlike Finland, already had a lot of writers with immigrant backgrounds, and immigration and refugees were obvious literary themes for them, so the Swedish literary agency, Salmonson, saw things quite differently, and they became my agents. Since then, I have learned that books about Estonia's recent history can touch readers from many different countries and even different continents. <coughs> Occupation, war, and its consequences are universal experiences transcending borders, recognizable stories that help us to understand one another. But without the translations, I might still imagine that these topics would be of no interest to anyone farther from Estonia than Finland to a neighboring country. Maybe I would have resigned myself to it, because even though I always wanted to be a writer, as a child of a Finnish Estonian family, I never imagined writing about the Estonian recent history. I had grown up with the idea that such stories are passed from one generation to the next in oral tradition all the while reading the principal works of the Western canon. They were part of the stock of public stories from which I got my understanding of what is important enough to publish, what stories are interesting to the reading public, and what books publishers want to publish, what is worth writing about, what is great literature, art. Chimamanda Mnochi Adichie, an author I greatly love, has spoken about the danger of a single story. When one narrative dominates, it creates stereotypes that become myth, as if by accident. Stereotypes and dominant narratives create the illusion that only they represent the truth. It's a problem that is familiar in other cultural fields as well. The Me Too movement made visible the power structures in the film industry and also exposed its economic inequalities, both of which are reflected in the stories we see on the small and large screen. Female characters have less dialogue, and unlike men, female performers find it significantly more difficult to get work as their 40th year approaches. Even in a country like Finland, officially respecting equality, 97% of the Finnish broadcasting is funding for TV programming has gone to male directors, even though the number of women graduates entering the industry is just as high as that of men. Because of all this, the masculine gaze dominates our visual narrative. The Soviet Union created a similar uniform narrative, and for more than half a century dominated the narrative of Eastern Europe, both inside and outside the borders of the Soviet Union. Its traces are still visible in which stories are considered important enough or interesting enough to be an essential part of the common knowledge, a general education. I went to school in Finland and during my school years there were maps hanging on the walls of the classrooms where the borders of Finland were clear, as were those of the Soviet Union, but Estonia was nowhere to be seen, let alone the other Eastern European and Baltic countries. A country that is invisible on the map does not exist for the others, irrespective of the reason for its absence. Such a country and the injustices or threats suffered by its citizens are difficult to talk about to outsiders. The existence of such a country is difficult to prove 
because it cannot be shown on a map. That would hang in a classroom, or printed in a school book, or a newspaper, or represented by a flag. Maps also leave a strong visual memory that can have lasting effects. After the early 1990s, Ukraine, Georgia, and Estonia were all printed on maps as newly restored independent states. At the time, calling women girls was becoming less acceptable in Western parlance, and today the oppressive purposes of the N word is understood. These linguistic developments can be attributed to the women's movement, anti racist activities, and the post colonial awareness that language is a means of exercising power to shape reality. But legislation alone is not enough. Equality cannot advance if one's language continues to create an inequality. In Estonia, it was understood that a newly restored independent state should use the language of an independent state. And this was also reflected in the publishing houses' programs and in the press. It was important to use expressions that reflected the real experience of the citizens, the occupation, deportations, and genocide that, according to Soviet propaganda, had never happened. By keeping these words out of the language, the Soviet Union had maintained a fictional reality and, through propaganda, created a world in which the occupation of countries it saw as its colonies was justified and so the force of the opinion prevailed in Western Europe, regardless of actual activities of the Soviet Union. By the time the Iron Curtain was torn down, the former Western colony, colonial empires had already entered an era where the exploitation of former colonies was being recognized and dealt with. The mother country of former Soviet empire, Russia, never undertook a similar decolonization process because it was never forced to do so. The Western learned to associate imperialism with Russia despite the fact that Soviet prosperity was based on the colonial exploitation and slave labor, and this is one of the greatest success stories of our Eastern neighborhood. In the West, imperialism was a term applied only to the United States and the Western Europe of the past, and their empires were conceived as something located overseas. The Soviet propaganda worked. It stayed dressing as a cradle of voluntary friendship between nations created an idea of a place that took hold. Using a classic mirror trick, it accused the United States of imperialism for decades and used numerous channels to broadcast messages filled with nothing but positive adjectives for the Soviet Union, thus obscuring any suspicion about itself. Because the West was not in the habit of seeing Russia as an imperialistic state, its core activity, expansionism, went unrecognized. Post-colonial criticism and its associated language has not become the standard usage when it comes to Russia and its activities. But we could not imagine France or Britain interfering in their foreign colonies' efforts to write their own history. But Russia is still doing that, and this has an agenda. In striving to disrupt Eastern European countries from writing history in their own voices, it silences criticism aimed at itself and normalizes the idea that its former colonies belong to the Russian sphere of influence. Estonia's struggle for the right to write their own history became internationally visible in 2007. When the Bronze Soldier dispute elevated the country in international news, there were Moscow riots over the Bronze Soldier, a monument to Soviet soldiers that was being transferred from the center of Tallinn to a military center. For Estonians, the statue represented the occupiers. For Russia, the memory of the Great Patriotic War. This conflict was believed to concern only Estonia, even though it was Russia's first visible hybrid attack on a European Union country and Europe. People elsewhere thought the problem didn't concern them. On August 23rd of last year, a memorial to the victims of communism 
the first of its kind in Estonia, was opened in Marima. The memorial was part of Estonia's centenary celebrations, and the opening day was not a coincidence. On the same day in 1939, the Molotov Ribbentrop Pact was finalized, and its secret protocol proved to be faithful to the world of space. The Russian media also took an interest in the memorial and claiming that Estonia was planning to destroy yet another Soviet monument. Although this was not really the case, the language used in the Russian press alluded to a new front social controversy. Russian news about the monument was illustrated with the bronze of the attitude. The fake news features pictures of the construction site for the memorial to the victims of communism and suggested that the empty space on the site had previously been a Soviet monument. These examples show that Estonians still have to defend their right to their history. And this, is also, this also applies to me as an author. Over the years, for example, European newspapers have published fake reviews of my books that can only be described as fake news, which in addition to targeting the author's person, also include disinformation about my work. These fake reviews are not about what the critics think about them. The purpose is to embed texts those whose content, content presents Russian interests and follows its narratives in a favorable light within incongruous newly cultural news and insert claims that characters in the text under fake review do such things as murdering Russians, even though no such thing occurs in the book. Few outlets bother to fact check a text disguised as a book review. Novels are hundreds of pages long, after all. So Russia's information war against the West also affects the cultural field and the publishing world across national borders. The Holodomor family in Ukraine between 1932 and 1933 is a genocide which also was denied by the West. According to historian Robert Conkhurst, it was the first major operation in which the Soviet Union adopted the big nine methods launched by Adolf Hitler to influence public opinion beyond its borders. If a lie is big enough, if it's colossal, no one will believe that truth could be so shamelessly distorted. The method worked, and is still working, since all too often one hears talk of a so-called controversy concerning the facts of the Holodomor. Russia has also continued to exert pressure on the other countries when it comes to the Holodomor. It does not want other countries to recognize the Holodomor as a genocide. But in order to understand Russia's current policies, we must study Ukrainian history and the Holodomor. The way Russia is using gas as a weapon is not new. Ukraine's energy resources have simply taken no place once held by its low-cost train, which Stalin, now enthusiastically rehabilitated in Russia, had the idea of using as a political weapon. It gave him a say in the West, but he also needed the currency it provided to buy the machinery for Soviet industry. Otherwise, it would not have been possible to achieve his over-ambition, ambitious five-year plan. So Ukraine had grain, and plenty of it, but the Ukrainians were not allowed to have it. It's a situation familiar from the history of Irish people as well. Using political and international intention of famine to crush the will of nations is very profoundly a European experience. Starving the Ukrainians was a way of making the peasants who opposed collectivization fall in line. And it's worth remembering that Ukrainian language was mostly spoken in the countryside, and therefore the Ukrainian speakers were the ones who were punished worse during the famine and the collectivization. Holodomor served to undermine Ukrainian national identity. Hunger was a weapon that not only starved human bodies, it was a weapon that exploited to starve the language and culture. The agenda was the same as in the case of the deportations. The national backbone was broken, resistance was crushed, 
more or less it was beaten down as people were encouraged to betray each other for a piece of bread. Genocide is not only the destruction of physical individuals, but also of cultures and nations. The Sovietization of Ukraine achieved through deliberate famine and political mass persecution continued after the Ottoman. The Ukrainian language was discriminated against. The history of Ukraine was not taught. The history of famine was not learned in schools. It became a secret oral heritage. Russian language became the language of success. <laughs> Studying and writing about the Holodomor has long been complicated in Ukraine by Russia's considerable influence on Ukrainian politics, which is why positions on the matter taken by the country's presidents, for instance, have varied according to their relations with Russia. Stories about the Holodomor are themselves important, but there are also good reasons to discuss the Holodomor and the repression of the Ukrainian language in the context of books. Because genocides of this magnitude affect the formation of a nation's publishing profession, not least when oppression measures target both the language and the culture. While countries such as France have developed their publishing structures, operating methods, and distribution networks over a very long period of time, the situation in Ukraine is different. The last Ukrainian translation of Manopardus, Norma, put just, oh, just over 100 euros in my translator's pocket. That's how much she got for translating the whole novel. The cost of living in Ukraine may be lower than in many countries, but even there, this is a very small sum. I myself ended up writing about Ukraine out of frustration. My latest novel, The Dog Park, has a Ukrainian protagonist and is taking place partly in Ukraine. When the Euromaidan protest started, followed by the revolution of dignity, I thought that I would soon have an opportunity to free Ukrainian books in English. When events in a country make headlines, publishers usually react. Although some books, some books like uh, Andrei Kurbov's, Ukrainian diaries have published in numerous languages. International interest in Ukrainian literature since the outbreak of the war has been lower than I expected. In Finland, it has practically non existent, despite the fact that Finns do read about the Ukrainian literature. But fiction always offers a deeper insight into a country, a window that a journalistic text cannot. However, other types of publishing related to the issue have been going on in Finland. For example, numerous works have been published about Finnish Putinists who have gone to the fight, gone to fight for the separatists in Donbass. The publishers, of course, are not conventional Finnish publishers, but new companies whose routes of support reach the Kremlin. Although I'm not familiar with the book selections of every European country, I would guess that Finland is not the only place where such publishing activities are occurring, and even if established bookstores may not include the books of such operators in the selection of their brick and mortar outlets, online offerings and their system of recommendations indicate that the same readers who buy legitimate books about the World War II or the Winter War also buy these books. In Finland, there is freedom of publication and expression, and that's a good thing. It's a value that must be respected. But, if the, but the first conference of work on Holodomor was not published in Finland until last year. It was under Abdelbaum's Red Family. If there were more literature, more movies, and more TV shows on the subject, Finland's position on whether the Holodomor was a genocide would probably be Citizens would have a clear idea of events, and their opinions would influence the positions of politicians. Can you imagine, for a second, what the world would be like if you had received the first complete, complete book on the Holocaust in your mother tongue almost 90 years after it occurred? Can you imagine how such a thing would have affected school curricula, for instance? 
Imagine how much easier it would be for Holocaust denials. But you haven't lost the ball. Western eyes were able to see what was behind the scenes immediately after the defeat. Germany no longer had the opportunity to do something like fabricating, fabricating census statistics to cover up its actions as Soviet Union's did. So it's worth returning to the question of why some stories are given precedence over the others. Why some stories attract more international interest than others. Why established publishers, big publishers, are more likely to stick to books from one area rather than another. Why knowing some things is essential to a good education and common knowledge, but knowing others is not. And why the big war in Ukraine isn't inspiring publishing to release great quantities or even moderate quantities of books by Ukrainian authors. Perhaps it's because they assume the topic wouldn't be of sufficient interest to readers and bookstores. Perhaps it's because Ukrainian authors are not well known. Perhaps that is why publishers haven't hired readers who are familiar with Ukrainian literature. Perhaps it's because very few Ukrainian writers have literary agents who would sell their translation rights abroad. Perhaps it's because there are plenty of translators of Russian and much fewer translators of Ukrainian. Perhaps it's because the subjugation of the Ukrainian culture is not very well known or understood outside Ukraine. Perhaps it's because raising the level of interest and the importance of oppressed cultures outside their own borders is inherently a slow process. And raising peasant language to a literary one in the eyes of the others is an extremely slow process, as is changing from an object to a subject in the eyes of others. This is a story familiar to many other foreign colonies. The Ukrainian writer Oksana Tsakutsko, whose works I warmly recommend reading, recalled of the persecution of Ukrainian intellectuals in the 1970s. The Ukrainian intelligentsia was terrified after all the arrests, so much that we all spoke Russian on the street and didn't switch to Ukrainian until we crossed our own press conference. The Estonian language had really easier Soviet times. Estonians did speak Estonian in public, but it was not at all uncommon that if you spoke Estonian to a seller in a shop, your answer would be one sentence in Russian. Speak the language of
conference over here. Thank you, Sophie Oxen, and once again for this keynote. And let's not forget to mention our Belgian musician for this evening, Noah van der Beele. in Amsterdam, but tonight he's here with us, and his new EP has just released Expansion, that's the title, and Expansion, that is where this evening is all about, you expand the love for literature. May I ask Mr. Tibor Navravic to our, our European Commissioner for Culture, Education, Youth and Sport to come forward, together with the Vice President of the Committee on Culture and Education of the European Parliament, Danse Nalbarde, would you please join me on this stage and give them a warm welcome. have you been the European Commissioner for Culture and therefore also for Literature. How do you look back? Well, um, that's a strange, that's a strange feeling, you know, I always really have to say goodbye uh, to a portfolio in a very nice area. I'm, uh, um, I'm a culture, I'm very committed to culture, not only as a, as a Commissioner, but but in my national activities as well, so I do a lot of groups. I usually attend uh, cultural events as well. So I hope that I can maintain some of the parts of my activities in my private life as well. In these five years, I think we achieved a lot uh, together with, with our alliance, and uh, we try to raise the the importance and the interest in. European literature, not as a something supranational one, but as a literature which can mirror the whole diversity of, of the national cultures, regional cultures, even local cultures. We celebrated last year the European Year of Cultural Heritage, which is also a very good occasion to celebrate the cultural diversity of the European continent and our European community. And I hope that my successor will continue this tradition. And how important is this prize according to you? I, I say every year that uh, the importance of, of this uh, prize is, is uh, much higher than, than we usually think. For instance, if I go to a bookshop in Hungary, in my own country, I can find uh, the books, not only Sophie Oksana, is quite well-known writer in, in, in Hungary, a very popular one, but also the former prize uh, winners translated books and novels. And I think the power of this prize is not the acknowledgement itself, but, uh, but the translation itself. So it, it can be promoted and uh, it opens up windows and opportunities for, for writers, for creators to, to be well known all across Europe, regardless of the linguistic and cultural barriers and differences. And I think that's the most important one that we are building up a common European cultural uh, space uh, by translation and by knowing each other. And with the help from uh, Europe. <laughs> Since May this year, you are Vice President of the Committee. What role can the Committee play concerning literature in Europe? Uh, good evening, and it's in my native language, in Latvian. Uh, so, uh, I'm a newcomer uh, to the uh, European Parliament, uh, but uh, uh, of course, from my previous background, I know very well that, that the Creative Europe program is uh, one of the programs that is very important for cultural community. So first of all, we still can secure funding for the creative program. And also, even more, we have to uh, fulfill the wish of the European Parliament to double the budget for, uh, for the program. It's, we think, to be challenging because uh, we don't know how the Brexit will finish. So 
so we can bring actually uh, difficulties for the budget planning. But this program is very important uh, because uh, it provides also a scheme for uh, literary translations. It means that every year um, publishing houses uh, can uh, submit uh, projects and get co-funding uh, for uh, translations, uh, dissemination and promotion of literary works. And it is a very important tool in the practice to promote diversity uh, uh, of culture and uh, uh, languages in the European Union. We just listened to, uh, to the very powerful uh, presentation of Finnish author. Uh, and uh, I, I, I would be happy that many parliamentarians would listen to that because it gave so many answers how we can, um, for example, uh, uh, explain in a, in a, in a, in a more uh, emotional way, people can get it uh, uh, to their hearts. For example, very difficult issues of 20, uh, 20th century history, I myself from Baltic country. And uh, uh, I, I, I feel the difference how it is when the, when the writer speaks about issues related to the uh, uh, Soviet Union uh, 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 censorship in Soviet Union, for example, and, and so on, Soviet propaganda. So when, we, when we politicians speak about, uh, speak about it, it sounds maybe sometimes even populistic, but uh, writers really can make a difference, uh, really can reach hearts of people. So it can be the power of literature and authors. You mentioned your successor already. Um, do you have a message for the commissioner designate? I can talk to her. <laughs> There's no need for her. I'm very interested to hear what you would say. <laughs> well, uh, she's a, uh, I think she will be very good also in culture. Uh, she's a very open mind. Uh, but also a uh, very experienced commissioner and former MEP, a member of the European Parliament. So Maria Gabriel will be just perfect for this job. And as a Bulgarian by origin, I think she, she really feels the necessity of keeping up national cultures, national languages, and to make, uh, to make this space borderless and, uh, and to, to understand each other more easily and more actually. Very well, thank you so much. And for this interview and your presence this evening, do stay seated because it's time for the awards and the awards will be handed over by you and the Finnish Minister of Culture, Hanna Kosonen. Would you please join us on the stage, Mrs. Kosonen. The first laureates will be presented by Nina Georg, the President of the European Writers' Council, and a German bestseller author, not to forget, Ms. Georga, come on and tell us, please, who will receive the first awards of this evening. Good evening, Your Excellencies, Commissioner, Member of the Parliament, dear book peoples, dear beloved colleagues, writers, and authors, accompanied by the beloved ones who wants to be with you to share in this moment. And I'm now speaking to you because I'm honored, not only as president of EWC, but as reader. You gave me so much. From your works, I learned everything what I need, empathy, democracy, other love, and other hate, and even how to kill a crocodile with a pen. <laughs> so, now, it's your moment, and I'm really honored to announce six of 40 colleagues. I will start with three, and I will start with you, the sound of hero. And let me invite now the first three winners. The European Union Prize for Literature goes to Pia Leino from Finland for her book, Heaven, 
published by Kustanamo S and S. Please come up and take the stage.
Because it's a great honor and uh, it, uh, I hope it's a great opportunity more for my book and more person for me. Thank you very much. And the Excellency, the Ambassador of Lithuania, and the permanent representative of Hungary to the European Union are asked to join us at the side of stage for the photos. Thank you so much once again. and the respected fellow Belgian Vivi, good evening. Will you please give us three more names? Well, ladies and gentlemen, as a publisher from this beloved country, I'd like to welcome you in my three mother tongues. Guten Abend. Bonsoir. Guten Abend. And as president of the Federation of European Publishers, I hope that many, many of my colleagues will be uh, inspired by these prizes to publish you who won the prizes. Many publishers, many of my colleagues have done before because we like to publish a variety of titles, a variety of books, a variety of languages. So I have three more uh, authors and publishers that we are going to celebrate. The first prize I'm happy to announce is for the book and Babuka Lit the Line. It's written by Giovanni Tosini from Italy and it's published by <laughs> Some people think that when you're a writer, uh, 
uh, each sentence you are saying should be some kind of wisdom. Uh, this sentence was not. <laughs> sorry, sorry about that. I, I, I didn't prepare anything which will or what would change your life because I can change my own life sometimes. Uh, I don't have any solution how to solve the problem of global warming or uh, plastic pollution or, or something. Uh, I'm just happy that I'm standing here holding some kind of book or something I don't know yet. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to prove that not all sentences from the writers are with this with are wisdom. So uh, thank, thanks to UPL and other organizations with long titles, which is not here now. And uh, thank you to uh, Ms. Sophia Oksanen for her speech. Um, because when you live in Georgia, you live under permanent danger uh, from your uh, north neighbor. Uh, who did not care geography in this school, I mean Russia. And, uh, and also thanks all other people around the world, which are uh, which lists are too long and I do not mention all of them. Thank you. All <laughs>
and the European literature prize goes also to the United Kingdom to Melissa Harrison for the book uh, in All Among the Marley, published by Longsbury.
evening, ladies and gentlemen, Minister, Honorable Member of the European Parliament, Excellencies, dear laureates, distinguished guests. It's been a great pleasure for me to be here today and have the honor of closing the ceremony. I really enjoyed getting to know this year's laureates and awarding the prize together with the Minister, the Honorable Member of the Parliament. I would like to thank our partner, the consortium in charge of the running the European Union Prize for Literature, the Federation of European Publishers, the European and International Booksellers Federation, and the European Writers Council. Thank you for your professionalism and commitment since the creation of the prize 11 years ago and for our good cooperation during my term. I commend your efforts to promote Europe's values and diversity with the creation of this prize. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a special moment for me. I will soon hand over the responsibility for my portfolio to a new commissioner. The last five years as Commissioner for Education and Culture have been very rewarding, and I'm proud of what we have achieved in the cultural field. The 2018 European Year of Cultural Heritage was a celebration of our common European roots and what connects our past and our future. It helped to put culture and cultural heritage high on the political agenda and right at the heart of many citizens' life. Another important achievement is the adoption of the new European Agenda for Culture, which puts everything in place for an ambitious European cultural policy in the years to come. I'm convinced that it will enable us to make the most of culture in driving economic growth and job creation, fostering social cohesion, and building strong relationships with our partners across the world. After long and sometimes tough negotiations, we now have a new copyright directive. Despite the challenges we still have to overcome in implementing it, this framework opens up new perspectives for the publishing sector and provides more protection for creators and artists in Europe. And of course, we have harnessed the Creative Europe program to support our world-class cultural sectors, making possible many artistic creations, stronger collaboration, and new long-term partnerships in Europe. Many artists and professionals have been given the chance to acquire new skills or perform outside their country thanks to our support. Audience development was one of our priorities, and I hope we have given many European citizens the opportunity to enjoy works, see artists, or read books from other European countries. Because, indeed, Creative Europe has an important role in supporting the book sector. European literature is incredibly rich and diverse, as illustrated by the 12 writers we are celebrating here tonight. Given that the translation market is dominated by a handful of languages, not only English. Many authors writing in less widely spoken languages find it hard to have their works translated and to find audiences in other countries. This is why I have been determined to promote diversity. The Creative Europe program has supported publishers from nearly 25 different countries for the translation and publication of more than 2,000 books in more than 30 languages. We also co-finance promotion activities because we are well aware that books will not reach readers without publicity and the relentless work of publishers and booksellers. We also support literature festivals and fairs as an essential element of the book chain. Ladies and gentlemen, I have worked hard to ensure that the Creative Europe program continues beyond and that it is green. I'm proud that the European Commission has made a strong proposal for the next Creative Europe program, which is being discussed by the European Parliament and the Council. I'm pleased that discussions are very positive. I would like to thank the European Parliament and the Council, represented here by Minister Kusana, for their support. I hope that the program will be adopted soon to best serve European culture and its diversity. And I stand ready to do everything to advance negotiation during my last weeks in office. I wish you all a wonderful evening and inspiring
least one family picture on these beautiful stairs. So all the laureates, all the ambassadors, excellencies are invited on these stairs for one last picture and then finally the reception. Thank you everyone. Enjoy this evening.